All right, well, it's uh, just about uh, five minutes after 10, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started and uh, we'll likely get a few more people, stragglers coming in. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Aaron Lamb. I'm the facilitator of the Informed Prostate Cancer Support Group. Uh, today is uh, our meeting at a special time here on the fourth uh, Saturday of the month. We do regularly meet on the third Saturday. Um, and uh, thank you for attending. We've got a, a great speaker today. Um, I'm, I am having uh, some minor um, computer issues today, so please do bear with me. Um, I, uh, uh, hopefully you can still uh, read the uh, slide that I have online. I know it's not full screen, but um, uh, that's what I've got for the day. As long as I can figure out how to get to the next slide now. There we go. All right, uh, hopefully uh, you are still dealing well with the um, uh, COVID uh, situation. Um, we have not yet been notified that we can return to the uh, Sanford Burnham Previs uh, uh, Auditorium, but we obviously will let you know as soon as that can occur and we can meet again in person. But until then, we'll continue to do the live streaming, uh, typically on the third Saturday of the month uh, uh, with uh, future speakers already lined up. Um, the principals of the Informed Prostate Cancer Support Group are Bill Lewis, our president, who also does our newsletter summaries, uh, Jean Van Vliet, our director and treasurer, uh, Steve Pendergast, our secretary, um, who uh, uh, edits our newsletters for us, Bill Manning, our director and videographer, myself, Aaron Lamb, the facilitator, and John Tassie, our webmaster. And of course, there's you, 900 members. Everyone can be, everyone is a volunteer and you can be too. And in particular, we're actually uh, looking for uh, someone who uh, might be a part of the, um, the, the VA uh, um, hospital system that might be seeking some treatment there. Uh, we're, we're interested in, in talking to um, any of the vets out there that might be part of that program that could um, help give us some answers uh, to uh, some of the, uh, the questions we have about um, how the VA system is working for you. So please do contact us and let us know. Um, our support to you is in the way of our website, uh, the Informed Prostate Cancer Support Group, ipcsg.org. Uh, from there, you can find our newsletter, which has fantastic summaries of uh, the prior meetings, as well as um, multiple um, scientific uh, uh, journal um, papers from uh, uh, the recent publication, um, you can uh, find quite a lot of uh, very uh, useful information there. Uh, you also find the link for our, our monthly video streaming on the third Saturday of each month. And perhaps most importantly is our hotline number. Uh, you can see it there. It's also on our website. And that's especially important for any of you out there that are brand new members um, that might have recently been diagnosed uh, or are trying to figure out what your next steps are in treatment. Please do contact us, whether by the website um, or using this hotline number and um, uh, Gene answers the phone. He'll get you in touch with somebody that can help answer your questions and help you get the best information to make the best decision uh, for your treatment. Um, as I said, we are looking for volunteers to help with recruiting and scheduling speakers. Um, we're also looking for people willing to share their experiences. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, we do kind of a roundtable discussion once or twice a year where our members uh, share uh, the treat their history and their treatment and uh, you know their thoughts on on their journeys and so forth. And so we'd be very interested in knowing if any of you out there would like to uh, share any recent, uh, 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 treatment information that you might have. Um, uh, we also do need help taking the hotline calls. Uh, so go ahead and contact us uh, if you're uh, willing to um, uh, uh, volunteer for us. Um, our support group purpose is we share patient-focused experience on becoming your own case manager through informing, networking, and caring. We're a group of experienced participants but we are not medical professionals. Any sharing by anyone of the group may not constitute a subject, uh, a substitute for your medical counsel. And we also do need your support. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, therefore, donations are tax deductible. 
We don't have any medical or religious affiliation. Um, and during the coronavirus pandemic, much of our expenses are still the same. We have a lot of expenses for keeping our, our website up and running, uh, our uh, mail server, um, our uh, advertising for trying to reach out to new members, um, et cetera. So please do consider making a donation. You can do that on, on our website via PayPal, or you can send a check to the address shown there. That address is also available uh, off of the website. Uh, our meeting next month on the 18th uh, will be with Dr. Richard Zabo. Uh, he's a urologist uh, from Irvine, California, and he'll be talking about a new topic that um, uh, we've recently started hearing about. Uh, many, most of you are probably familiar with uh, transrectal biopsies, but there's a uh, newer procedure uh, on trans transperennial biopsies. And... Uh, Dr. Zabo will be uh, comparing those um, um, to, to uh, give us some new information in that regard. However, for today, we have with us uh, Jane Shellhouse uh, speaking to us on nutrition and lifestyle strategies for all ages that support growth, development, and healthy aging. And I am going to turn it over to you, Jane. Uh, let me just uh, take a moment to stop sharing this set of slides and get over to the other computer and um, share the slides there. Um, as always, uh, please feel free to answer, enter any um, questions that you might have using the Q&A function of uh, Zoom, and uh, we'll address those at the very end. So um, Jane, please take it away. Thank you very much, Karen, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, as you can see from this slide, uh, it says I'm a clinical nutritionist certified in nutritional microscopy or being a microscopist, which I'll talk about in just a moment. I've also, by the way, uh, done live presentations for the Orange County Prostate Forum. And you might also be interested to know that I am also too a cancer survivor, over 20 years cancer-free from colon cancer with no other treatments except for surgeries I've had no radiation and no chemotherapy, just functional medicine treatments. Um, I thought I would give you uh, an opportunity to understand a little bit about me and what my background is. Yes, I have been doing clinical nutrition for 34 years, but if you can look at me, I don't look that young having only worked for 34 years. So um, you might be interested in knowing I have a BS degree and I taught English and children's theater for 10 years and then went and got a master's degree in communications and spent the next 10 years working internationally as communications consultant and wound up working for what is today ESPN, doing a, um, an off-camera documentary for travel. Very interesting, very exhausting. And that put me at the age of around 40 years old. And I said, I'd really like to own my own business. I've always been interested in nutrition. And um, after doing a little bit of research, I realized I could buy my own nutrition business and teach people at least to start how to eat well. I had to go to school for that. And after about two years of a highly successful business, I realized there was more that I could do for people. I realized that they needed more. I certainly could help them by helping them to eat better, teaching them how to eat better, because that's what I wanted to do again is teach. But I also knew that there's a lot more on the table that I wasn't addressing. So once again, I researched. And at that time in the early 90s, late 80s, there was no online classes. So if you were to go to school, you had to go either in person, which I really had no time to do, or you could take correspondence classes, which is exactly what I did. I became certified in clinical nutrition. And the, with that schooling and also the schooling offered by many of my nutraceutical vendors who offered marvelous products, but also offered marvelous uh, seminars, I was able to learn a great deal and have been able to help a lot of people, uh, which is I'm going to talk about right now. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Ah, okay, so I've already told you that I've spent 34 years in business as a clinical nutritionist. And my practice focuses on giving people tools to provide better health care for themselves. What does that mean? Well, in today's medicine, 
you've had surgery perhaps, or perhaps you haven't had surgery, perhaps you've just had treatments, but your physician, as good as he is and as, as necessary as medicine, allopathic medicine is, very often they don't talk with you about how you can personally get involved proactively in your own health. And that's what I do. So when people come to my practice, what do I help them with? I give them knowledge, okay? I give them knowledge. And if I give them knowledge, I can empower them to do something for themselves, which is extremely important if you want to stay well, stay cancer free. Uh, and I think that um, by doing that, I give them hope. I also share the fact that I am a cancer survivor if they happen to be cancer patients, because I work with all kinds of cancer, not just prostate cancer, and giving them, again, a nutritional arm to help them battle successfully what they've got going on. Hope, inspiration, counseling. I offer programs. I don't just see people once and give them a piece of paper and say, this is a good, this is a good program. This is a good diet. I'll see you later. I design programs where I talk to people extensively at length confidentially, because lots of times people come to you with one thing, but there's a lot of other things going on that if they had more chance to talk about it, they would be better off uh, mentally as well. And of course, I talk about foods that are healing, foods that are harmful, and then nutrients that we know can make a difference. I know people buy a lot of nutrients and because they're searching for something to help them over the counter. And there are some good things. I work with nutraceutical vitamins. Okay. I work with nutraceutical vitamins, which means here's the difference between over the counter and nutraceutical vitamins purchased through companies that offer true therapy and remedies. The difference is absorption. Most of the time when you take things that you buy over the counter, they may look very, very good, but they do not have an ability to help you to absorb them. And as you age, you absorb less nutritionally. So the things that I use, you usually get 80% of them into your system, as opposed to only about 20% of things that are over the counter. So that's really important to know. And people have definitely told, been able to see a difference in those products. Next slide, please. Everybody is on a journey. You all have something in common because you have prostate cancer, but your journeys are different. Maybe you've just been diagnosed, as Aaron said. Maybe you've had surgery. Maybe you haven't had surgery, but you've been having treatments. But of course, the question is, what are you doing for yourself? Before, I'm gonna talk about this very specifically, but what I'd like to mention is that I'd like to have anyone who's listening go and Google and find yourself a clinical nutritionist or let's look up nutritionists. We are different. Nutritionists um, are different than clinical nutritionists. And the reason why that is, is because in clinical nutrition, there's a lot of different kinds of very important testing that you can do to help really help people arrive as what you can do best for them. A nutritionist doesn't have the education or the um, power to be able to do that. Um, so I'm going to say, please look. Also, by the way, since we can Zoom now because of the pandemic, that is one, I think, good thing that we have available to us. Um, if you're interested in talking with me at all beyond a text or an email or a phone call, I would be happy to Zoom with you to talk uh, about concerns. And I think that that might be helpful. But let me tell you specifically what I do here in my office. And I, do, I don't do all of that for everybody. But this is what's available. The very first thing that a lot of times I do, besides having someone fill out a health assessment with prostate cancer or anything, is I run something called a plasmography uh, test. It's a method of body composition. But most of you know what body compositions are, which are pretty simplistic. They look at your weight and they look at fat and lean. But a true plasmography test looks at nutritional status, which means it looks to see how well you digest and absorb your food, how well you hydrate in, at the cell level. It looks at how long your red blood cells, which feed you, live. If they die early, it means that you're having a problem and you're not absorbing, and therefore you're actually shortening your uh, potential 
uh, life. Uh, also, it looks at um, basal metabolism. How many calories do you, during, do you actually burn resting? And because of that, then I can help people determine how much calorie food they should really be eating and what. I also do um, so something called nutritional status testing using blood and urine. And to do these types of tests, I have always worked, not necessarily under, but with a physician so that I can use with their permission, of course, their license, so that I can order any kind of blood, urine, stool test that I think is necessary to help this person. And um, most people may not be, who are nutritionists don't have that advantage because they're not willing to pay, the, pay somebody to, to do that. But I always have done it because I can't really get to the bottom line unless I have specific tests. Uh, more normal blood tests. If a person comes to me, I always ask, you have a recent blood test that I can look at because I'm looking for certain things that maybe your doctor doesn't look at. Remember, your doctor is a diagnostician and I am not. As a diagnostician, he's looking for something that he can treat you for. And if he doesn't find anything particular, he's finished. He doesn't, he can't offer you anything. As a clinician in nutrition, I am looking to track where you are in all your ranges of all your blood tests to see if you're going low, if you're going high, and get you some help before you go out one way or the other, and that have to be diagnosed. And that is the big difference. I also all the time ask for vitamin D tests because so many people, you think in the state of California, you wouldn't be... Um, you know, having a problem with vitamin D, we have so much sun, you have no idea how many people are deficient in vitamin D. And vitamin D is extremely important for the absorption of minerals, especially calcium. It is a huge heart protector. It helps your brains. And it also helps you with different kinds of cancers. Uh, I also do healthy uh, stool evaluation. I work with a lab out of the East Coast that's very renowned for their clinic nutrition status testing. And uh, it's been very helpful getting people to the bottom line. We look in between the lines of what's going on to help them get better. And finally, um, I offer stress testing. If I find people to be chronically stressed, they can't sleep, or whatever is going on with them is causing them stress, I do an evaluation of their cortisol using saliva so that I can uh, see if they still have cortisol, which is a coping mechanism for your body. It helps you to cope. Uh, if they don't have it, then I have to help them uh, get it back because you can get it back, but you have to know where, where you're, what you're dealing with. As I said to you already, I do work. Um, right now, I work in a chiropractor's office. I've had my own offices, but I'm working in a chiropractor's office, and um, his license does provide me the ability to order any test. Um, in the state of California, because I'm a clinician, not an MD or a DO, uh, insurance companies don't want to pay for me because I'm preventative. I am not diagnostic. I do, however, take health savings plans um, for people who are still working, whose companies offer health savings plans. I think that's, that's a piece of valuable information to know. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Anyway, so we're going to take a little journey today. We're going to talk about prostate cancer. And um, as I said before, you're all on different journeys, depending on where you're coming in to this talk. And as I said also before, my job is to offer you a nutritional arm. I'd like to start out with a case study. About 10 or 11 years ago, this person was not my client. I met him and we, in some kind of a social setting. And we were talking and he, you know how people ask, you know, well, what do you do? And I told him, well, at that time he said, oh, he said, I have a son who has epilepsy and he's a grown son. And I said, oh, I said, well, what's been happening with him? And he told me, and I said, well, I don't hear any kind of nutritional intervention. He says, no, there hasn't been very much. And so I said, I offered him an opportunity to, to get some information. So he came to my office, I gave him that information and then uh, he said goodbye because he didn't think he needed anything at that time. Two months later, he called me. He said, I have been diagnosed with prostate cancer. At that time, he was 67 years old. And he said, I've been told I need surgery right away. And I invited him to come into my office and talk a little bit more specifically. And I said to him, so I'm assuming, I asked him what his PSA score was. And he said it was you know, six. 
And he said they did a Gleason test and it said it was found that I had cancer in my prostate and that I was to have surgery. That was what was offered me by the urologist. I said, oh, maybe we, are you open to any other kinds of information? And he said, well, yes. I said, well, I said, there may be more people doing this, but in Orange County at the time, as far as I knew, there wasn't. And I offered him the opportunity to go to Ventura. And I, I don't know whether Dr. Dupont has talked with, spoken with you all at this forum. He's been a pretty popular radiologist over the years, uh, has a very successful clinic in uh, Ventura and offers colored Doppler ultrasounds. The importance of colored Doppler ultrasounds, which makes them different, is that when you do a colored Doppler ultrasound, you are looking at the prostate and you are looking at the calcification and you are looking at the cancer and where it is in the prostate. And that's extremely important. He decided, uh, Howard decided to go to Ventura and meet with Dr. Bond. And by the way, Dr. Bond's office uh, didn't accept insurance for this particular kind of work. So you had to pay for it. It seemed to me it was worth it. And he examined Howard. Um, no, Keep on that slide, thanks. Uh, he decided to examine Howard and do a Doppler. And what he found was that the cancer, yeah, there was cancer, but it was, you know, it was, had, it was in various places in the prostate, but it wasn't a lot. Most of it was calcification. And that is why PSAs are so unreliable. Uh, you can have fellows that have PSAs that are very high, 10, 11, 12. They don't have cancer, they just have calcification. But you could have someone who's 44 years old and have a, a score of four and have cancer. So you really, again, PSA is not def definitely a marker you want to deal with only. You obviously, uh, if the doctor is um, having any uh, concerns or if you have, uh, have had hypertrophy, benign, which means non-cancerous problems with your prostate, and your, your numbers start to change, I can see why he would want to do a Gleason for you. Um, so what the doctor, Dr. Bond, recommended to Howard is that he, we watch and wait. He asked him to come back in three months and looked at his, yes, we did a PSA. And um, then he went back again and nothing had changed. By that time, Howard had come to my office and said, I think I'd like your help. Can you help me uh, control this? And I said, yes, I can help you control it. So next slide, please. So what did we do? Howard at that time was taking, the only medication he was taking was cholesterol medication. He was slightly overweight uh, and he was interested in learning how to eat better. He worked full time and he wasn't having any particular symptoms. He wasn't really having any symptoms of hypertrophy um, and any of the issues that sometimes men have with hypertrophy before cancer. So I said, what I'm going to suggest you do is this. In my research with zinc, first of all, zinc is a hugely important nutrient for the prostate. I had been doing zinc testing for a really long time. You do it using liquid, liquid zinc tally to test to see if a person in their mouth actually to see if people have any zinc. It is amazing to me how many people do not have ample zinc in their system. And the importance of zinc, it, it runs over 300 enzymic uh, functions in the body, but it is a healing aid, huge healing aid to skin, wounds, internal or external. And not to have zinc in the system is extremely uh, something that you want to change. Uh, I, I use um, a couple of different things. I use, li li use liquid zinc here as a therapy. And I also use a, a pill here um, by a company called Metagenics, okay, called Immune Active. Excellent sources of zinc and some other things. Also, vitamin D3. Um, it's really interesting. As I said, in the state of California, you have all this uh, sunshine. And I have done zinc, sorry, D testing for years. Nobody has sufficient amount. So what's a sufficient amount? Well, the range is 30 to 100. So your doctor will say, if you're 32, you're fine. You're not fine. 
if you, most of the people who I'm talking to here are probably in their 50s, maybe some are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. 45 nanograms of vitamin D3, not B2, D3, which is the sunshine vitamin. Um, if you're, let's say, 40 or below, you should have 45 nanograms of zinc. If you're older, you should have 65 to 85 nanograms of zinc, uh, sorry, vitamin D with K1 and K2 in your system, not just vitamin D3. K1 and K2, unless you're on blood thinners, you can't take K1 and K2, but if you're not, uh, vitamin D3 with K1 and K2. I find that in the stores, you can buy them, obviously buy vitamin D3, uh, sometimes with K2, but most of the times not with any of the Ks, which are built in for absorption. But I usually give my clients 5,000 units of vitamin D. And I do check it after about 90 days to make sure that they're loading it. Uh, I never have seen anybody who took vitamin D3, 5,000, go over the recommended limit of them. Sometimes people have trouble absorbing and they just need to keep taking. I, I have recommended that people stay on vitamin D because if you take it and then stop, it goes away. It doesn't just stay in there because you've taken it for a while. So vitamin D3 seems to be critical uh, to help with prostate, heart, brain, that kind of thing. Also, I recommend magnesium. Again, magnesium is another one of those minerals that your body depends upon highly, especially your heart, your muscles. Uh, and I also re recommend a very highly absorbent, which you cannot find out over the counter, multivitamin for men without iron. Men don't need iron uh, to take iron. Uh, but the key factor here is absorption. You have to take something that is going to absorb. And you don't, again, you can have all the nice words on the back of the bottle, but it is the delivery system that you're looking for. And I will tell you, I didn't put this on a slide, but the better multivitamins will say that the product is delivered into your system by a company called Albion Laboratories. That's who puts in the delivery system, okay, of chelation. It helps you to absorb. Also, I recommend a vitamin C, anywhere from one to 4,000, <coughs> pardon me, a day. Um, some people can't take a lot of vitamin C. It gives them diarrhea. But if you could take vitamin C, according to Linus Pauling, some of you who may know who that is, <coughs> vitamin C is extremely important for fighting cancer. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I'm going to get to products that I find to be very valuable for helping you, so it keeps you from forming cancer cells. <clears throat> and also helps your testosterone to keep from converting to estrogen <clears throat> because as you get older and your testosterone starts converting because you begin to have aromatase factor, that's what it's called if you haven't done any reading on this. The product that I'm talking about is DIM. It's, pro it's pronounced di and, uh, and dolymethane. It's, it's much easier just to remember DIM. You might be able to find that in the marketplace. It didn't used to, <coughs> excuse me, but you might be able to find it. It's very critical. I give it to women who had breast cancer because it helps. Again, it's, it's a neuromonase like factor and it keeps their uh, estrogen clearing because in breast cancer, women who get it, instead of their liver clearing the estrogen every month, and clearing it so that it just is normal. It stores it. Well, after a while, that's a problem. But if you take DIM, whether it's for prostate cancer, to help your testosterone not turn to estrogen, in breast cancer, it helps the liver to clear the estrogen. So DIM is extremely important. The next thing I want to talk with you about is Oncoplex. Oncoplex is a marvelous product that was developed by Johns Hopkins University. They were given a grant by the National Institutes of Health to develop a product that was made from cruciferous vegetables, i.e. broccoli, cauliflower, etc. It's a hybrid kind of broccoli 
that we know uh, if you take it and you have cancer, it really, really helps slow or stop the production of cancer cells. It is sold exclusively by one of my uh, nutraceutical companies and I use it on all cancer patients. Most of the cancer patients I have had have had either breast cancer or prostate cancer, but Oncoplex works on all cancers. And DIM is a really good product to use for not just what I suggested, but any time you want to keep um, any one of the hormones from getting overactive, you want to use you want to use that. Next slide, please. So it's now 2021. And I have worked with uh, Howard for 10 years. He stayed with me. Did he need to? No. But he, I don't see him all the time. But I do see him periodically. And he still takes all of the nutrients that I suggested for him, plus eats better. And he still now sees Dr. Bond. He's gone from seeing Dr. Bond every three months. And once Dr. Bond felt that the cancer was not growing, it was very so, because a lot of prostate cancer, as you, you may know, doesn't grow, it just kind of stays there. Others are more aggressive. But as I said to you before, uh, if the cancer is inside the capsule and there's no metastasis. That's why he wanted to watch it. So he now sees, uh, well, his last visit was last year with uh, Dr. Bond. And as you know, do, may know or may not know, Dr. Bond, who I mentioned to you earlier, uh, has retired and he now uh, is, uh, has turned over his business to Dr. Benjamin Johnson and Dr. Jamel Mwasher. He's, they are still in Ventura. This is their phone number. I also know that and have learned that there is another physician in uh, Corona Del Mar. I beg your pardon, that's not true. Corona, uh, Marina Del Rey, excuse me, I just lost it for a minute. Marina Del Rey, that is an oncologist, but he also offers colored Doppler ultrasounds to look to see where the cancer actually is in the prostate. And you may want to look up colored Doppler ultrasound in the San Diego region and see who, if any, one offers that. Because I really think that depending on where you are in your journey, you should consider doing this because it gives a lot more information to you and to your physician and helps you to understand what the next, next step might be for you. Now, Howard is going to see the new doctors this year. He's down to visit, visiting, visiting once a year, but when the last visit that he had with Dr. Bond, the cancer was practically non-existent. It had gone away. Uh, and I was very excited to learn that because I think that what we are doing is making a difference for him. Next slide, please. Now what I'd like to talk about and this, I could talk about this for a long time, but I don't have a long time. So I'm going to give some information that I know for a fact is true. And I'd like to start out with alcohol because I think it's extremely important. The research on alcohol and prostate cancer is this. If you've been a beer drinker or are a beer drinker, I don't know what your physician has said to you about alcohol and prostate cancer, but beer is not your friend. There's been research out for years that says hops in beer promotes prostate cancer. Whereas red wine seems to be healthy overall. Doesn't seem to be, if, I mean, if you do anything in excess, it can be problematic. But what I'm saying to you is that you should find something else to drink if you're drinking beer because hops are a problem. I think you can get beer without hops, but it probably is wise because alcohol turns to sugar and cancer loves sugar. It just makes it grow very rapidly um, that you find something else to drink. Also, as a clinician, regardless of why people come to see me, I don't like to take people off of 
protein, meaning the four-legged, two-legged kind of protein. Of course, there's a lot of plant-based protein. And if you know how to eat a more vegetarian style, it can be very healthy. But most people have no clue how to do that. And that's what I do teach that here because I have people who wish to be more or completely vegetarian. Um, there's different kinds of vegetarianism and I do teach it. Uh, but I, want, I like to go back to the protein element though. Remember, you need protein. Proteins are the building blocks of the body. Your red blood cells need protein. And what makes protein? Amino acids. We need, those are the building blocks for the entire body. So you can't take it out, not know what you're doing and think that you're eating a plant-based based diet and then that makes, you might be healthier in one sense, but you're not healthy or in another. Um, if you don't like fish, uh, and a lot of people do not, fish um, is a very nice uh, alternative to meats. Um, yes, fish will have some mercury in them, more fish that are fattier, which are good for you, by the way, like salmon, mackerel, things like that, are very good for you. Um, but they do have uh, mercury in them. Uh, but you then again have to say, well, if you're eating beef, uh, unless you're eating grass-fed, it can be a problem, depending on how much fat you eat. But also, you need to know this. In the research that I've done, red meat also can push diabetes forward if you eat it a lot. If you eat it sometimes, even once a week, it might be all right, depending, okay? If your doctor, if you have a cholesterol problem, your doctor might have told you not to eat uh, red meat, depending, you, depending on what your physician says. It should be grass-fed, and it should be something that you eat. Let's just say you should eat it probably no more than a couple of times a month. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that um, feeling that would be better because we know that it can increase testosterone. And if you're, not doing an, if you're not doing anything to decrease your testosterone, um, that could be a problem. So we're talking about, I like organic chicken, organic turkey. If you're, going to eat, if you're going to eat some kind of meat, fresh organic eggs uh, are good. I'm not a real, uh, I don't like dairy foods that well. Why not? Well, dairy food, when I say dairy, I don't mean eggs. I mean from cows. It's most of the products are treated. The cow is treated. You can buy untreated products. Uh, the human body does not break down cow's dairy products very well. Mo molecules are very large. And that's why a lot of people have trouble with, them, with dairy products. So I ask people to decrease their intake of dairy, I think it's wise, if they want to eat some mozzarella cheese occasionally. If, however, if they're interested in eating goat's cheese or goat's yogurt or goat's milk, goats are much more molecularly like humans and it's easier to digest, tolerate. So if you're interested in goat's cheese, you can buy something called pecorino, which by the way is sheep's cheese, which is also very good. And you can grate it or cut it and eat it. It's very tasty. Okay. Now, things to avoid also, uh, processed food. Do not eat a lot of sausage and a lot of bacon, a lot of things that have sodium nitrate in them for, so that you can eat them. Uh, luncheon meats, um, a lot of times you can buy them Trader Joe's, for example, has meats like this that you can be that, uh, buy that have no carcinogens. Sodium nitrate is considered a carcinogen. So you want to really work to eat um, healthy food, fresh food when possible, fresh salads, steamed vegetables. Some people don't like them. They like protein and they like their meat and potatoes, I know. You say, well, what can I do? I really don't like that stuff. Well, there are... Interestingly enough, there are plant-based protein drinks that you can buy that actually have what we call the essence of the fruit and the vegetables in them. So you're not getting fruits and vegetables in there. You're getting the essence of what they give you, the antioxidants and so forth. And uh, I don't think you can buy them in the store, but um, nutritionists should be able to get them for you from their nutrition, uh, nutritional suppliers. 
and they are really good um, for you. But if you do like fresh fruits and vegetables, I mean, you should be eating, as a male, you should probably be eating three whole uh, fruits a day. Not, don't knock yourself out on bananas. They're good for you, but you shouldn't eat them every day because they're too high in sugar. But there's lots of other fruits that you can eat, especially here in California. We can get most anything that we, we really want. And um, make sure you wash them well. And you also, by the way, if you don't know, if you're living by yourself or you don't, nobody in your family cooks very much, there's a company called uh, Freshly, F-R-E-S-H-L-Y.com that makes a very, very healthy, nutrition, nutritious meals. You should go online and look that up. They're, they would be very good because you need to eat balanced. You can't eat one meal a day and think, oh, this is what I've always done. This helps me stay thin. Well, no, you probably lost a whole bunch of lean tissue. And what happens is when you do that, your body has a tendency to store fat. And that brings me to the concept of balance, okay? Balance is extremely important in your life, balance and food. So you should be eating something called breakfast, something called lunch, and something called dinner. And you should have a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables in there. I also might mention uh, another product. I didn't put this up on the slide for Aaron, but there's a, there's, a, um, there's a really good food bar, protein bar. You can buy it online. You can buy it in the store. Uh, if you really like it, there's like seven or eight different kinds. It's a, called a one bar, O-N-E bar. Why do I like it? I like it because especially if you're eating less meat, um, you could do this possibly for breakfast or for a snack. It offers you 20 grams of protein, which is almost three ounces of protein, plant protein equivalent, whole protein equivalent. Uh, they have, they're delicious and they have a, a, some carbohydrates. They only have one gram of sugar in them and they're quite acceptable and my clients really like them. So I would like to pass that on to you, but I wanted to get back to this concept of balance. It is really important in your life that you have had that you have balance, and it's never too late to get it. And balance in your food, yes. But let's just say you're a workaholic, or you were a workaholic, and you're now retired. I'm hoping you're finding something of use and purpose to do with your life now that you're retired. If you are retired, and if you're not retired, you have to look at your life and say, is it in balance? Did I get this prostate cancer because I'm uh, drinking too much, not eating well, working too long, not having any recreation, not having any exercise, not any, having any quality family time, not having any social time? You have to look at your life and see, do I need to rebalance this? Do I need to do a, a little check, cross check on this? The answer probably um, is, is yes. Uh, so balance is extremely important. Now, one of the last things I want to talk about under food and alcohol, and you can change the slide, Erin, is something that I give so many of my clients. It's called glutamine. Glutamine is one of the 10 essential amino acids. Remember, uh, I talked a little bit about amino acids because you find it protein. But it is one of the 10 essential amino acids uh, but it's very, has a very, very individual uh, characteristic. It makes it quite unique. Glutamine, when you eat it in food, of course you get it. You can take it though. If you've ever worked out and you wanted to help your muscles, maybe you took some glutamine powder, okay? But glutamine not only helps muscles, it is the only amino acid that crosses a blood brain barrier and can affect your dopamine, which is one of your major neurotransmitters. Now, why would you want dopamine to uh, be affected? Well, first of all, dopamine, if you have had too much alcohol, you, and you know that you drink quite a bit, um, and you'd like to stop, but you're having a problem, if you were to buy glutamine powder and put it either in a protein drink or just drink it in water, it reduces the dopamine level and you stop craving it. I use dopamine, I'm sorry, I use glutamine here um, when I have people come in who have terrible sugar cravings. Sugar is an enemy for you because cancer loves sugar. It loves it. So you wanna cut down on your sugar. To cut down on your sugar, you may have to take some glutamine. And you usually take it about a 
three quarters of a teaspoon of glutam, good glutamine powder, which you can buy anywhere, by the way. When I say anywhere, in a, a good, like in Sprouts, Trader Joe's, they have it. Um, a health food store would have it, powder. And you want to use three quarters of a teaspoon either in a protein drink in the morning or you can stir it in uh, room temperature water and drink it once or twice a day. And it will, not, it will reduce and stop your cravings. See, when people are trying to make a change, in their life and as far as food is concerned or alcohol or cigarettes i've gotten people to stop smoking cigarettes using glutamine as well it is a fabulous fabulous nutrient so um i use it all the time here and i find it very very successful because people want to do better but it's terrible if you have something on your back that says oh you really want this you really want this and so you do it. So you want to get rid of some of those types of habits. If you have cravings for sugar, um, and, it, and that sugar is either from sugar in pastries, not fruit, but in pastries or sweet things, or in alcohol, you can use it. And it really, really, uh, it works. I just was looking to let my notes to see if there's anything else I want to mention. There's a lot of things that I could talk with you about. I mean, layers of conversation. I have given you, I design menus. I mean, I write them out for people so they can follow them. Uh, I, when I speak live, I have handouts. And um, I chose not to do that specifically today. If you were interested, I would be very happy to uh, send you something. At any rate, um, to end the talk again, my name is Jane Shellhouse. I'm located in Placentia, California, in Orange County. Um, you could change the slide. Thank you. Um, I have two phone numbers here that you can feel free. I have a, uh, an email and um, I have a website. If you wanted to look it up, you should be able to find me. Uh, you could just type in the name of my company, which obviously I have not said here. It's Diet Nutrition Support. That's the name of a company. If you were to put that and Google that, uh, in Pasetia, California, you would find me. You could probably go online and look at my website, which is pretty good. But if you just had a question and just want to talk, I'd be very happy to do that. Um, there's always lots more information, but I think I've given you a good summary of um, how food and nutrients can help. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I understand now, Erin, that uh, if people have questions, they can uh, put them in the chat. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions yet or if we are going to have any questions. Let's see, I don't see any questions yet, um, but I can certainly fill in some of mine that I've been writing down. Uh, I, I see I one in the chat. In the chat. Uh, no, not, maybe that's yours. Nope, none. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and did I get that website correct? That is my, uh, where did you put it? Oh, sorry, I put it in the chat. It said dietnutritionsupport.com. Is that what you said it was? Yes, that's fine. Okay. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, one of the, uh, let's see, it, it's it's been a couple of years since I've, I've heard about this. Um, but uh, when I started uh, my radiation and ADT treatment, um, I happened to come across something about uh, fasting. And I'm not referring to just the intermittent fasting, um, which to me, you know, sounds almost like, you know, just don't eat too late <laughs> um, compared to how I, I was uh, brought up to, to have my meals. But um, you know, fasting over the course of several days, not that this is something that should be undertaken by an individual without proper, uh, um, proper oversight, but what, what is your thought on fasting? What I've heard is that you know, this partially reduces the, you know, essentially the available sugar in your blood and the cancer cells have a lot of uh, difficulty surviving in that type of case. Let me answer that this way. Um, I've never particularly been an advocate of fasting, I mean, what you're saying makes makes some sense. Certainly, um, I believe that. Start, I mean, people we know people can go for probably two weeks without food and live, but I really believe people need to eat well, good foods throughout the day. And I think that if you stop eating at six o'clock at night and don't eat again until let's say uh, eight or nine o'clock the next day 
that's 15 hours that you're not eating, which is really a lot of time for the body to um, break down, digest. I know why you're thinking about several days and why the research talks about several days. Um, I, I'm just not an advocate of it because I think most people who have cancer are already nutritionally deficient. And I don't know, I'm not quite sure if starving yourself for three days is going to really help you that much in the long run. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe it's more of a preventative type of thing, but but yeah, you do have an excellent point. Like um, you know, starving yourself for three days might completely throw off all of your, your nutrition levels. Um, you know, could well, do a yeah, lot more harm than help. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of people want to do who ask me about the uh, the fasting thing that's going on right now. And I said, well, if you stop eating, as I'm just going to repeat myself, if you stop eating at six and don't eat it until at nine, that is 15 hours. That's a long time. He said, that I agree. Or people will not do anything and then they'll just eat one meal a day. Let me tell you something. Eating one meal a day is not beneficial because when you do eat, that food wants to turn as fat because the body said, where's the food? I mean, so they, they, it stores. It does mm. not necessarily do that much good. So mm. that's just my read on it. Gotcha. I have a question. I, I'm starting to see questions come in now. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Let's take a look at this. I'll do the Q&A first. Um, the first question that I see here says, what do I think about taking protein powder 100% whey with 24 grams protein after exercise? Mm -hmm. I think recovery uh, is really good. And I know for years and years, uh, they talk about whey. Whey, of course, is a milk product. Um, there are um, pea and rice-based products that give you a lot of protein uh, in them. And I'm not always an advocate of whey, and some lots of people have problems with whey. Remember, is a is part of milk. It's not milk totally, but it's very much a part of milk. So I have a tendency to just shy away. But let me answer your question. Um, recovering is important after exercise, and giving yourself back amino acids is important. So I like the idea, and I do advocate it. But sometimes I'll just suggest people try something else besides whey protein. Uh, the next question would be, um, how are eggs for a protein diet? How many are too much and, and can they be taken daily? Any impact? Well, let's put it this way. If you don't have a cholesterol problem and you do eat eggs and you do eat meat, then you should be able to feel comfortable eating eggs. Eggs are a phenomenal source of protein. I know that they've been given a bad rap over the years, but eggs are really quite a perfect protein. The yolk is the protein uh, where the cholesterol is. The white is protein, but it doesn't have cholesterol. So you could, I suppose, eat egg whites. But I think the yolk is really important. So how many a day? Well, one a day would be fine. Um, some people like to eat two a day. If you don't have a cholesterol problem, I would say two a day would probably be okay. But if you have a cholesterol issue and you're taking cholesterol medication, you can still eat eggs. If you have a cholesterol problem, meaning your uh, cholesterol is, you know, over 200, 250, and you don't, in your HDL, your good cholesterol is low, and you know what low is, which means for men, it should be, it's below 39, and your LDL, which is a bad cholesterol, is over 100. You probably want to just take it easy if you don't want to take any cholesterol medication um, on eggs, but I, 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 I hate taking them out of the diet because they're really good for you. Okay. Is caffeine with protein powder and fat-free milk after exercising each morning bad? Um, let me answer it this way. I don't think it's bad. Um, are you, is there a reason why you're putting the caffeine in there? Why don't you just have a cup of coffee and then drink your protein drink uh, like that? If you like fat-free milk and it doesn't bother you, doesn't give you a running nose, doesn't give you a stomachache, fat-free milk in your cafe in your coffee was fine. But I, I think I'd like to see it separated um, as opposed to putting protein, putting all that stuff together. Maybe you like it that way because it tastes good. But um, and having a drink of coffee, um, I don't suggest more than two cups of coffee a day. Um, 
because they say caffeine is fine for you. They, they go on and on and on and argue about this, and it doesn't affect your prostate cancer. That was what you wanted to know. No, I don't think so. No, but I'm also just giving you my read on caffeine and mixing it together. I'd like to, I'd rather see it separate. Next. How is it to use barley malt or black sap molasses instead of sugar or sugar substitutes? Well, black strap molasses is, is, is pretty healthy. Um, I'm assuming you must be maybe using it on cereal or using it as a sweetener. Um, sometimes I even tell people to use 100% organic honey, not very much because it's sweet. And um, I think that's good. Or 100% uh, maple syrup is also uh, good for you, but nothing in excess. And if uh, I probably prefer this molasses over the barley malt, um, but not very much of it. You don't need very much of it because it's intense, but I think that would be okay. What about agave? Yeah. You have to watch agave. Um, why do you have to watch agave? Um, people, you know, once they think they're doing something healthy, they usually, it's about amount. A little bit of agave syrup is okay. But I, I really think that probably honey is, uh, it's probably, healthier if you want to make a comparison but a little bit i mean i have i asked my clients what do you put sugar in well basically i put it in everything well then i said we need to cut cut that out it's about amount sugar in coffee sugar in iced tea sugar on cereal sugar on your grapefruit it's like good grief you could have you could wind up with tablespoons of sugar every day and that would not be good for your cancer at all next Uh, the answer to the question, is your nutritional advice also applicable to cases of reoccurring cancer after a prostatectomy? Uh, yes, it is actually. Yes. I mean, I would love to talk with people about that. Um, is the reoccurring cancer, uh, where is it? What happened? What is it a metastasis is it just a cancer in another, another place? Actually, it actually is in metastasis if it shows up someplace else. But there's a lot of nutritional stuff, therapy you can do to help yourself. Okay, next question. Oh, I don't like the taste of coffee. The coffee grounds and protein powder tastes like a milk coffee milkshake. Okay, fine, no big deal. Have at it, it's fine. Uh, in the, in the, oh, in the case of that question, I think he had said also fat-free milk. What's your feeling I, on fat versus non-fat milk? Well, people obviously do that fat-free milk because they're trying to cut down on milk fat. Uh, personally, 2% is fine. I mean, if he, if he thinks he's doing himself a big favor by doing fat free, I think 2% um, is healthy. I mean, milk is healthy. It's just, we worry about how it's processed is the real issue. And also, um, as I said to my, to you in my talk, I don't like the way cow's milk breaks down. It's too big molecularly for most humans. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. So we have other questions on the other um, three questions on chat. Um, actually, all of those uh, got oh, moved okay. over to the Q&A, so we already addressed okay. those. But right. speaking about the, the processed food, um, you know, there's a lot of hype these days about things such as Beyond Meat, but some people have said, hey, wait, that's an overly processed vegetable protein, essentially. What, what's your take on, on that type of protein? I hate it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I look, I go to... Um, Let's see, mothers, uh, well, those stories that carry a lot of that stuff. And I look at that, people say, oh, I'm getting my protein. I'm eating this. I said, that's, that's all made of grain. And it's not, it's not like a balanced grain with some legumes or something like that. You mm -hmm. need, if you're going to eat vegetarian, um, you need to have, let's just, I'll just give you an example half cup of, and some kind of beans. It could be, as long as they're not refried, they could be any kind of beans, black beans, kidney beans, garbanzo beans, cannoli beans. But to that half cup, you have to add some kind of healthy potato or yam or rice or quinoa. And I'm a gluten-free advocate. I do a lot of stuff here with gluten-free because wheat causes malabsorption. I didn't have a chance to really talk about that. I'm not a big wheat advocate because of what I know it does. And I see the difference in people's nutritional scores when I measure them, when they stop eating wheat, they feel better. 
So. All right, let me find some of my other questions. Um, okay. Let's see. Yeah, I was a little bit curious too with the, the glutamine. Um, I wasn't aware of, of that uh, that's effect in terms of kind of counteracting sugar cravings. Is it the type of thing that you're suggesting that you regularly take every morning and it kind of like helps you avoid the cravings throughout the day? Or is it more of like, oh, I'm having a craving. Let me take this instead. Well, in that programs that I offer here, uh, glutamine is part of the program and you take it every single day. I see. And if you're having a gut issue, you take it for quite some time because it really, really helps uh, heal the microbiome, which is a lining of your gut, which is where things can transport out of and cause lots of other problems. So it helps to heal the gut. And also, as I said, it helps lower your dopamine levels, which is your neuro major neurotransmitter. And um, if people have craving, they can take it. If they just want to do something healthy for themselves in the form of gut healing and just doing something healthy to make sure their gut's healthy, they can do that. And they don't wait. It's not like I have a headache, I'll take an aspirin. They should take it. Um, and then, and then they should take it for quite some time, but they'll say, well, now I don't crave anymore. Should I stop taking it? I said, well, you're not craving because you're taking it. So if you have taken it for a month and you feel like you'd like to try your day without it, go ahead, gotcha. you know, but I'm going to tell you something. If you feel that you don't have those responses and you say, I, you know, I can go ahead and eat that piece of cake. I don't have those craving responses. If you put sugar into your system, it is so addictive that it'll reset the whole response back up again. It's like sounds alcohol, like, but it's not like alcohol. Yeah, it sounds like a heroin addiction, yeah. Not quite. <laughs> not that I would know, <laughs> not that I would know. <laughs> Anything else? Um, yeah, uh, I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail on, on the different fish types. Um, I know you mentioned salmon and mackerel are quite good. Um, do you have I'm any not, also yeah, do, on the you, whole farmed versus non-farmed? Yeah, I do, hang on. Okay, okay. I'm getting a handout. This comes out, uh, I have a, a handout that's a really good handout um, from the Environmental Defense Fund, who looks at all this stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, I have a very nice handout. It says, best choices, okay? Mm -hmm. Wild-caught wild salmon is always going to be better than um, farmed. Wild caught, I don't know if you ever go to the grocery store and see salmon choices and it says, this has been dyed. Why do I want to eat a piece of dyed fish? I don't. Um, but wild caught has nothing going on with it. Um, we have uh, albacore tuna can be very good in US and Canada. Uh, Atlantic mackerel, uh, farmed. They have, well, here's one that's farmed. Clams, mussels, oysters, and scallops farmed are good. Uh, shrimp uh, from Oregon, don't ask me why. Uh, and then snow crab from the US and trout farmed in the US. Um, also, more choices from the EDF. Uh, grouper, which is of Gulf of Mexico. Haddock, which is basically East Coast. Pacific rockfish, Pacific sole, Pollock red snapper, etc. The worst choices. Atlantic salmon, that's farmed. Bluefin tuna. Imported fish. Anything imported is considered worse because of the waters. But I pay attention. A lot of that stuff comes from other countries. And we don't know anything about it. Sure. So they, they don't advise it. Yeah, yeah. I've also heard that, you know, especially with some of the um, the conditionals put on the location, such as you were like, you know, why Oregon for that one? It's like that that they've only been able to confirm like area wide in some places that that nobody is violating their their uh, requirements type of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't hear either on the good or the bad, uh, a, a very steaky fish such as uh, swordfish. I assume that that's really more of a no. You're kind of looking at the softer it's fatty It's not fish. even mentioned. It's not even right, mentioned. Right, right. So I imagine it would be a no. Yeah. Although I'll tell you something. It's really interesting. I don't know what they do to swordfish today. I have it, oh, occasionally. But when I was a kid, man, it had the most interesting taste. I mean, I don't think I even liked it. You can't. Swordfish is like mild-mannered. It's really pretty good today. It's probably not very good for us. 
but it's not on this list. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, just kind of as, as an anecdote, um, my mom used to have, used to have a shrimp allergy and she ended up eating uh, salmon one time and had that same allergic reaction. And as it turns out, she looked into it and they basically feed up ground, uh, ground, excuse me, they feed yeah. ground up shrimp shells to, to, to the, the fish. I mean, a lot of this farm stuff is just being fed garbage basically, yeah. or in yeah. fact, injected with the, you know, the, with the ground up uh, shrimp, just, just to add that color, that dye, which just absolutely blows my mind. <laughs> it's crazy. It's awful. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, I see that there's a, a question that came in. How about catfish and tilapia? Tilapia comes from Asian waters, tasty, but not particularly healthy. Catfish is a bottom feeder. And a lot of times it's probably not wise to eat bottom fed fish. Um, there's a lot of fish that people like that you really should check how would they get their food sources from because everything settles to the bottom, good and bad, and you probably don't want to eat it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you on that. I've been hesitant on catfish, to, despite coming from an area where you can get catfish uh, 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 fairly regularly. Yeah. Um, all right, well, thank you so much. Um, this has been a, a wealth of information for me, certainly some things I'm going to be taking into account in my own diet, um, especially rethinking the whole beer thing. <laughs> I've kind of grown back towards, you know, I went for two year, a year or two without drinking any alcohol and have kind of gone back to it now that my PSA is zero, but I certainly don't want to see that PSA be anything other than zero. I should have mentioned if everybody, if there's anybody still on there, uh, I, there's three things that create and drive prostate cancer that I've that it continues to be in the research. Number one, highly saturated food, high fat, high fat, like lots of steak with lots of high fat, beer, and multiple sex partners. Uh, my longest client I've ever had was 44 years old. He didn't drink uh, and he ate well, but the third thing was definitely him. And that's why he got prostate cancer. So uh, in the research I've done, it says that. So I just thought I'd mention that in closing. Interesting. Um, yeah, that has not been brought up here before, even with our, we had a, a men's uh, sexual therapy, uh, men's sex er, uh, <laughs> expert um, last month, I think it was. And he didn't mention anything like that. So it's good to know. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. Um, uh, we'll certainly put uh, people in touch with you as well as um, we have a copy of the slides here that we'll be um, uh, making available as well with your contact information. So again, thank thanks you so, so much. Very your... much. All right. Take I care. Really appreciate... Take care. And thank you for putting the slides together for me. I really oh, you're welcome. It. You're welcome. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.